Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day, and welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and to all those who are listening in online now or at a later time. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your love to us. We thank you so very much for life. Thank you for the strength and the encouragement that you provide for us each day. We thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, we, we glorify you for the incarnation, for the crucifixion, by which you made atonement for our sin, for the resurrection. Jesus, we thank you so very much for the resurrection, for eternal life. And we thank you so very much that you are seated at the right hand of the Father even now. We thank you. Father in Jesus, we thank you so very much for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you dwell in each and every believer, all those who know and call upon your name. We pray that you would be here with us today. As we know that you are, we pray that you would make yourself known to us. Father, our petition, our petition today is that you would speak to each one of our hearts and to our minds and to our very souls. The transformative word that you have for us whether a word of knowledge, a word of teaching, a word of instruction, a word of encouragement, a word of challenge, a word of rebuke. Lord God, whatever that you may have for us here today, we pray that you may give it to us. Lord, we're here for you. Please come. In your name do we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the question for us here this morning is, who do you follow? There are many today who clamor for our attention, who desire our opinions to match their own, who want to have you follow them, and quite possibly those who want to devour you. To a certain extent, this is unavoidable for those who preach and teach to want your opinion to match our own. And yet today, what we need to see in our text in 1 Corinthians is that I want us to be of, want us to be encouraged to humble ourselves before the living God, submitting ourselves to Jesus Christ and the gospel alone. Let's take a look at how we get there today. Please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and we'll be working through this text in our continuing sermon series on Corinthians. Text begins like this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Here Paul is, is pleading with them. Now something that we need to know about the entire book of 1 Corinthians, the entire letter, is that Paul's authority in this church is being challenged and is under question. So as he's working with the Corinthians through this letter, he does not command, but he appeals to them. And the appeal there is meant to be based on relationship. We have enough of a relationship, O Corinthians, for you to honor my request. And then he states the way for healing to happen in the Corinthian church. He says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ, of course, has that um, title of Lord, that he is God, but then he also has the character and the reputation that is well known among them. He is Lord and Savior, and it is only through him that healing will come. And that's what he means by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he has the end goal that all of you agree. Why? Because there's something that's the matter in the Corinthian church. What's the matter is that there are divisions, disunity in mind, and differing opinions. And so he says the opposite, that there be no divisions among you. But that you be united in the same mind, that's not our own mind or even any leader's mind, but that is the mind of Christ Jesus, that we all be of the same mind of Christ Jesus and the same judgment. Now here, judgment, don't think about um, a judge on the courtroom pronouncing a judgment. Here this Greek word means opinion, um, judgment, or it can also mean purpose. So it has kind of a, a weird cross section of English meanings, opinion, purpose, and judgment. And what we're meant to understand there then is that they all come to the same terms of how they see things. All right, that's the end goal here, is that they're all coming to the same way of seeing things. And here we might go, okay, well, so what further is the problem here? Well, we get that to in verse 12, but first in verse 11, we see the utter astonishment of Paul that divisions are actually taking place in the church. Look here in verse 11. For it has been reported to me by closed people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And the English uh, is actually a little too strong there. It's, it's more like, for it has been actually reported to me. He's expressing surprise. He, he can't believe that this report is coming. Number one, Paul didn't have any knowledge of divisions in Corinth before this report came. Number two, the Corinthians had just written him a letter, and they didn't include any of this in the letter. And so it's actually coming from a, from a first-hand testimony experience, Chloe. Chloe is going to be a rich woman in the New Testament. And what this means is that maybe a family member of hers or a slave or perhaps a business partner of hers was in Corinth was Christian and participating in the church, then came back to where Paul is writing from, which is Ephesus, and saying, hey, did you know this is going on in that church? There is division among them. What sort of division? Verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul. Or, well, I follow Apollos. Or I follow Cephas. Or... I follow Christ. Right, that's got to be in the holy tone. I follow Christ. What's the issue here? Well, remember that, that things are not what they seem um, after the Reformation in 1400s. When we think of quarreling and strife, there, there can always be different issues in churches, but normally one of the things we think about is theological breaks. Don't we? We think, well, well, they're, they're in disagreement on different theological positions, and that's because the Reformation modeled that for us. So now we have about 30,000 plus denominations today over all these theological disagreements. And then we take that in our modern perspective and we read it back into 1 Corinthians and go, well, Paul and Apollos and, and Peter, Cephas, they must have been just talking about different things and having different theology. And that's why they're breaking. They're disagreeing on some points. The commentators that I read are emphatic. This is not a theological break. That is not what's happening here in 1 Corinthians. What's happening here is a power struggle. 
And to get there, what we need to do is understand some things about Corinth. And I'm just going to remind us a few things from last week, and then I'm going to begin to apply it to this week. Remember that Corinth is a port city and an extremely important part of Greece between two bodies of water. They actually help to transport boats from one body of water over the road right around Corinth to the next body of water. It's an entrepreneurial city. It's competitive, pragmatic, and pluralistic. Part of power in the culture of Corinth, and indeed parts of the Roman Empire, had to do with, of course, money, as you might expect, but then also relationships, which we may not expect right away, but when we think about it, that makes sense. And what would happen here in these relationships is that you would have powerful people of wealth or people of wealth who want power. And what they would do is they would associate with, with, with people in, in the public square who seem to have influence over others. And what they would do is they would provide for their needs. Here's uh, in the, what it's called in the ancient context as a patron-client relationship. The person of wealth gives money to the teaching philosopher or whoever's in town, and then that teaching philosopher, while they're influencing the people with their teaching, go, oh, and by the way, what a great patron this person is, and oh, let me just recount the wonderful deeds of how they are, right? And through this, they begin to gain influence and power. Now, what's happening in the church then in Corinth when we're reading, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ, is that there's people in these churches looking to associate with these powerful influencers in the church and thereby gain Power, power to do, power over people in the church. So, an ancient way of describing this is like a tree in a vine. And a philosopher would describe power, they would say, you know, the, the teacher in the public square is like a tree. And as the tree grows, what you want is you want to be the vine. And the vine just curls up the tree, doesn't it? And begins to ascend as the tree grows in ascendance. So that's one ancient example of this sort of power play. I think, I think we too have some idioms or expressions like that. Don't we say um, something like grabbing onto the coattails of another or riding on the coattails of someone? What does that mean? When, when somebody's riding on the coattails of another person, what it means is that um, they're kind of, as the person is moving and going, they're getting a free ride up into um, prominence with the person who's on the up and up. We also have a, another game these days. It's called name dropping. You want to get something done somewhere. What you want to do is you want to tell them who you know. Because it's all about the context. It's all about who you know these days, right? So you begin to name drop. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but I worked with list off some powerful person, right? Or, uh, you know, I actually know so-and-so in this business, right? And you begin to name drop. That's, and that's not good or bad. That just is. But what that is is it's a representative of a power play, right? We're, we're having power by name dropping, all right. Um, and, and so what's happening here is that sort of thing. People are dividing up around these powerful influencers. Well, what sort of power does Paul or Apollos have? Well, let's work through it. Paul is simply the founder of the Church of Corinth. All right, so he's the founder, he's the, he's the instigator. So people are claiming, well, I know the founder, I'm with him, right? Therefore, I should have power. Who's Apollos? Apollos. Turn with me to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 25. 
We see Apollos and says this, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. What do we see about Paulus here? Well, to put it in modern terms, Apollos is a clever, wonderful preacher. He's like the best preacher you've ever heard. He's good. You know what I mean? He's a, he's a good preacher. And in ancient times, one of the major things in the public square that mattered was something called rhetoric. Right now, it's not necessarily the same thing as we think of rhetoric, but ancient rhetoric is the way in which you say things. And there's forms and there's customs for doing that. And the better you are at that, the better speaker you were prized as. Apollos was really good at rhetoric. All right? he, he's, he's a great preacher. And so what do people do? Well, they grab a hold of somebody who in the culture would have been an influencer. Paul's massive in the church. He's the founder. Apollos is working in the church and bringing growth, but he's also going to have an impact better on Gentiles because he does it in such a clever way. He's an up-and-up up preacher. Well, then you see Cephas. Well, Cephas is, is Peter, and he's, of course, one of the original 12 apostles. Now, one of the things that we just don't know is what in the world Peter was doing in Corinth. And in my commentary studies, we're just like, they're just like, we don't even know if he was really there. Right? They, Paul might have just been naming names of different people to get us across the sense of the issue. Um, and so people say, well, I follow Peter. And the final one, we almost think the final one would be the right answer. At least I did when I was reading this. I was like, well, if I'm going to be in a camp, I want to be in this camp. I follow Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ, we all know about him. He's the one who died on the cross, rose from the dead on the third day, forgave forgiveness of sins, ascended on high, and now rules over his kingdom and his people. So there's a natural gravity for people to say, well, I want to follow Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. I want to follow him. And yet Paul actually rebukes this position First, fascinating. Turn with me and look in verse 13. Is Christ divided? Or in some text it might be, is Christ apportioned out? What does he mean? Well, he's talking and specifically rebuking those who follow Christ who are almost implicitly denying that other people have Christ because they're following other leaders. And what he's saying is, how dare you think that you're the only ones following Jesus as if Jesus could only be in one section of the church. He's rebuking that position first. And then he begins to rebuke the others. Was Paul crucified for you? What is he saying? How dare you put me on the same leadership level as Jesus? Or how dare you say, I follow Paul? Paul didn't do anything for you. He, didn't, he wasn't crucified for you. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, again, this is, this is a, another dig, another jab into this whole uh, ancient context that we have going on here. Um, first, let's explain what baptism is, just from a, a little bit of a different perspective. Remember, just in general, baptism is an outward sign of an inward change, right? It's the signpost that we belong to Jesus. And here, Gordon Fee is going to help us out when he says this about baptism, he says, baptism is about entering into enduring relationship with the one in whose name you were baptized. 
So when you get baptized, it's about an entrance into an enduring relationship with that person. Well, what power games are people playing in the ancient context? Well, they're playing this game of, I know and have a relationship with Paul or Apollos or Cephas. And therefore and thereby, I'm gaining power. And Paul just erases that and goes, look, the, the main thing is just the relationship and the enduring relationship with Jesus Christ for all of you. Right, and so, and that's his emphasis, and that's what he's what he's saying. He's look, look, you weren't baptized in my name to have an enduring, continued relationship with me. You were baptized in the name of Jesus, so that you can have an enduring relationship with Him. And then Paul says this, and, and this is uh, this is just a reflection of Paul's state, and he's he's angry and disturbed, and he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may be say that you were baptized in my name. Then it's almost like somebody's standing there as he's letter writing and kind of reminds him. They break in. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. And he basically is just he just wants to be done with it, right? It doesn't even matter if I baptize you. The, pur the purpose is that you're supposed to be about Jesus. And then he goes in and digs deeper into this whole faction thing. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent words of wisdom lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Paul brings the whole question home to the church. It's all about the gospel. And what he says is this, and, and Paul's, a, Paul's a genius, and he's a, he's a master of um, uh, rhetoric as seen in his letters. It's, it's very clear he knows all about that sort of stuff. But he chooses not to use the forms and customs of the day. Why? Because he thinks and he believes, and so should we, that the cross of Christ can be emptied of its power by, uh, by, by moving into just certain forms and having the form be the power. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. The gospel does not require eloquent words. The gospel is brutal. Jesus Christ died on a cross for sins that you and I committed. That is brutal. And it's wonderful. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again to offer freely forgiveness of sins by grace. And it doesn't require anything else other than that to communicate the gospel with power. There's a lot more to the gospel than that as Jesus saves us from our sins even in our daily lives. Andrew Thistleton, a commentator on 1 Corinthians, writes this about this passage. Over-reliance on clever rhetoric may provide an inauthentic shortcut to transformation by the cross of Christ, which becomes nullified as a means of restoring relationship with God himself. What's he saying? The charm, the passion, the rhetoric, the skill, the drama, how it makes the Corinthians feel, all of it is inauthentic, not real. It's fake. And it took the place of the power of the cross. So what's our practical application for today? There's actually a lot that we can mine from this passage. But the first thing I just want to say that I don't think we can mine here is the power play bit. I sure hope nobody is developing relationships in the church as a means of a power play to gain power in the church. That's what's happening here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. I don't think that portion of it is relevant for us. Um, I think we can just say, all right, we need to be aware of that. Very good. Let's move on. Here are some other applications that are extremely important for us, though.
First, in Christian culture today, there is a strong tendency to want to identify with certain camps in Christianity. Oh, I identify with this big church preacher. Or I identify with this big church preacher. Or I identify with this other teacher or preacher or professor or whatever have you. And we tend to try to do that. And, and sometimes even it becomes a, a point of virtue signaling to other Christians that like, we're all right. I'm good, right? And we use the, these sorts of teachers as, as ways of talking about certain theologies and associating with us with, with those theologies in order to say, well, I'm in the right camp. And so we name drop in order to get the point across. And the question isn't about liking a certain teacher's preaching or teaching. That's not what I'm trying to express. What I'm trying to express is we need to be secure in, our, in Christ enough to not need to be in a different camp in order to feel secure. You don't have to say, well, I, I just agree with, then name off some big teacher, or I agree with this big teacher. We should be secure enough in Christ to say, look, I don't have to name drop to other Christians or a virtue signal to them or, or say, well, I'm a part of this or this or this or here's my theology. We don't have to do that. What we focus on is Christ. The second major warning for us and application for us today is that we should not this is going to sound harsh, and, and just know that I love you, and I'm not meaning to sound harsh, it's just going to be. All right? So I, I kind of apologize beforehand, and now I'm going to say it. Don't just like a preacher or a teacher because you think they have great style. Oh, they just, they just, uh, they're just such a rock star personality. Oh, they're so charismatic. In that, in that sense, what I mean is charming. Oh, they're just so charming. Oh, they just tell the best stories. Oh, they make me laugh. Lo I just love how they make me laugh. They make me feel so good. No. Please, no. No. Now here's the thing, we need, to, we need to have good preaching. I'm not saying we don't need good preaching. The world needs good preaching. Amen and hallelujah. And yet don't like somebody just because they preach well. Think about the content of what they're saying. Think about the content of what they're doing. What are they communicating? And allow what they're communicating to touch your heart. Because here's the thing, if all we do from church is leave feeling real good, then that's all we're going to get out of it. And by Wednesday, we're going to need a recharge because the Word of God didn't touch us on Sunday. And what we need is, is less like, I'm feeling really good and all oh, this is awesome and all oh, this is so many good stories and or jokes or whatever. And what we need is to touch the Word of God so that God can touch us through it. What we need is the Word of God communicated to us in a way that transforms lives. And when the Word of God is in transforming lives, you know it's about the, the outer style instead of the inner substance. It's like caressing a water bottle instead of drinking the water. Worthless. I'll say it again. Worthless. It's rubbish. It's inauthentic. It, it's fake. It, it shortcuts the transformative process. Now again, I'm not saying we don't need good preaching. But, it's a big but. But the, 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 the it's, it's about the substance. Alright. Number three. This is a warning for preachers. Okay. And a warning about those whom you follow. So watch out. This is also a warning for you to be considering about those who you follow. Andrew Thistleton, a commentator on 1 Corinthians, says this. 
But to treat the gospel of the cross of Christ as a vehicle for promoting self-esteem, self-fulfillment, and self-assertion turns it upside down and empties it of all that it offers and demands. Basically this, if anyone is preaching the cross for any reason other than the redemption of people and the discipleship of the flock, that is a person who shouldn't be preaching. That's a person who should not be preaching. Beware the people who are always asking you for money. Right? Beware. Beware those who say, well, you are not secure in God unless you send me money. Beware of those people who make the, state, make the whole thing just all about themselves. And you can identify them because when they go on TV and they're asked the hard questions, like is homosexuality a sin, they start to stutter and go... Because it's all about them and their personality and what they want, which is popularity and power. And they won't answer the direct questions that Scripture answers. Watch out. Watch out. Number four. In our day and age, denominations are a thing. I know we all know that. I'm going to state the obvious. Denominations are a thing. They're everywhere. In the first Corinthian church... Denominations didn't even exist. There weren't words in such a thing as denominations. All right? But I think this scripture can apply for our talk about denominations. I'm going to put contrasts before you, and you tell me which one is more important to you in your mind. Is it more important to be Mennonite or born again? Born again. Is it more important to follow scripture? Or to follow a person slash denomination's beliefs? Right? And the answer should be Scripture. Right? Scripture. Well, then guess what? Scripture is going to shatter a whole lot of denominational frameworks. No denomination has it all right. Which means what? We need to read. We need to study. And we need to pray over Scripture so that Scripture masters us instead of leaving Scripture on the shelf and going, well, I believe and here's my denominational statement. Amen. Right? Now, denominations are useful and helpful. Sometimes they, they, they can distill some major points of doctrine down for us from the Bible, and that's helpful. Not everything denominations do is wrong, but beware being more devoted to a denomination than to Christ. In our society today, I actually think that there's little more important than knowing Scripture well, reading it, and studying it, and praying through it. Why? The deception is so great and so far-reaching, it penetrates everywhere. And there are well-meaning, sincere folk who, folk who teach false doctrine and who teach falsely. And you will not catch them unless you know Scripture intimately. I'm telling you, it's all over the place. Beware. What do we need to do? Grow in God. Grow in the knowledge of the Word. All right, so what do we do about all of these different things? Um, three things that I'm going to share with you. Number one, do not follow your heart about whom you follow. One, do not follow your heart about whom you follow. If your heart is telling you, this feels really good and it's super awesome and I just love it all and I just can't wait to hear more about this person, question that. It doesn't mean don't. So there's some really good preachers and teachers out there. So it doesn't mean don't. It just means be aware that you are not missing content because of style. 
Don't lose out in, in analyzing the content of what is said just because there are some great illustrations and stories or the style of what is said. And I hope you, you're getting the point. You all should have your analytical glasses and be like, all right, I'm, I'm going to start doing this right now. And amen and hallelujah. Right? Do not follow your heart. Use your mind and think carefully about what's going on. Do not follow your heart. Number two, lay down any party lines that we may have. If we have them. Right? If we have party lines... Lay them down. Number three, this leads then to an emphasis on Jesus and the gospel. Jesus and the gospel. Um, I was listening to a, a preacher yesterday, and uh, it's, a, it's a preacher and teacher I like. <laughs> I know it seems to be like, what? But seriously, we, need, we can have preachers and teachers alike. I was listening to a preacher yesterday, um, and one of the things that he was saying is that in progressive Christianity, right, one of the, one of the core things um, that is missing progress from progressive Christianity is that they actually don't follow Jesus. Like, Jesus is optional for them. And actually, there are some other issues that become more central, like um, LGBTQ acceptance and social justice and things like that. And we need to be careful that in our church and in our lives, what we do is we need to emphasize Jesus and the gospel. That is the center. He is the one that we grab onto, and we follow him in his word. Three... Content over presentation. There should always be an emphasis on content over style. Which means this, if someday I was feeling bad and I just preached like this, the scriptures say that we be born again. Instead of saying, oh, this is so boring, what we would say is, all right, I'm going to have to do a real hard job right now of paying close attention because the content coming at me is more important than the presentation of what's happening. Watch out. Watch out. Number three, your lifestyle is more important than you feeling good after church. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for that to sound so harsh, but I'm going to say it again. Your lifestyle is more important than feeling good after church. What does it mean? If the word of God is being preached in such a fashion that it touches our hearts and our minds and our souls, then we should begin to grow in Christ and in Christ's likeness in such a way that our lifestyle shows that we are disciples of Jesus. And that is far more important than saying, wow, what a good sermon today. Really enjoyed it. I feel really good. Those songs. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I'm gonna, it's great to have good music. So hallelujah and amen to all of our pianists and instrumentalists and people who sing. We're going to have some amazing music happening today. Hallelujah and amen. We need good music. It's nice to feel good. There's nothing wrong with it. And lifestyle is far more important than that. All right? What we do. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for you and for your goodness and your love. Lord Jesus, we, we just want more of you and more of your spirit. We want to follow you even better each and every day. We looking towards you, Father, and we know only you can do it in us and in our lives. Help us, Lord. Guide us rightly to discern who we should follow, who we listen to. Help us to over-focus on what is being said and content and comparing that and matching it to Scripture. Help us to know you more.
Lord Jesus, come. In your name do we pray. Amen.